Greetings and welcome to the Dave. Today we'll be looking at the freshwater angelfish. In this video you'll learn how to take care of them, how to breed them, and how to raise their young. You'll also get to see them lay eggs, see the eggs develop and hatch, then see the babies grow into adults. It's all here, so let's get started. Freshwater angelfish are native to South America where they live along the edges of slow-moving rivers such as the Amazon and some of its tributaries. The edges of these rivers typically contain a dense growth of aquatic vegetation, fallen trees, and submerged tree roots. These areas provide lots of places to hide and breed, as well as an abundance of small food items for their developing young. The water temperatures typically hover around the low to mid-80s. The water is soft and slightly acidic. During the rainy season, when the rivers overflow their banks and flood the forest floor, there is an abundance of food, water, and space, which then provides the perfect conditions for breeding. The thin body design of the angelfish is perfectly suited for moving through dense vegetation, while the vertical stripes on the body help the fish blend in with its surroundings. There are three known species of freshwater angelfish, but only one of them is commonly found in stores. Not including the fins, this species can grow to a length of around 6 inches and can reach a height of 8 inches or more. The common angelfish has been selectively bred to produce several different varieties of angelfish, such as the koi angels, black angels, half black angels, marble angels, veil tail angelfish, blushing angels, pearl scale angels, golden angels, and the list goes on and on. The angelfish pair seen here are known as Philippine blue angelfish. There are literally dozens of different angelfish varieties to choose from, however, all of these different fish are all the same species. Some of these specialized varieties are more delicate than others, but under the proper care, most angelfish can live for ten or more years. Luckily for us, angelfish are fairly adaptable and have been bred in captivity for so long that they can now tolerate a wide range of water parameters. If I'm breeding angelfish, I keep them at a temperature of somewhere around 82 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. This is at the higher end of their temperature range, but I prefer to keep the water warm because warm water increases the growth rate of both the adults and, most importantly, the young fry. And the faster the newborn fry grow, the more likely they'll be to survive, especially in the first few days after hatching. Another advantage of warm temperatures is that the adults will lay eggs more frequently. In fact, if I remove the eggs after spawning to a separate tank, the adults will usually spawn again within a couple weeks. However, there are drawbacks to keeping your angels at these higher temperatures. It shortens their lifespan, promotes the growth of harmful bacteria, and causes a reduction in the levels of dissolved oxygen. So, if you're not breeding this species, then 75 to 80 degrees is probably better for long-term maintenance. If you go much lower than the mid-70s, it weakens their immune system and makes the fish more prone to illness. It's not that they can't survive at these lower temperatures, but it's definitely not an optimal situation for them. When it comes to water hardness, they're just as adaptable, and the typical commercially bred angelfish can handle most public and private water supplies. However, very hard water can cause problems with low egg fertility and reduced hatching rates due to the large amounts of calcium in the water. When it comes to pH, try to keep them at a neutral pH of about 7, but they can easily adapt to anything between 6 and 8, but try not to get hung up on exact numbers because, as I said earlier, angelfish are very adaptable.
I maintain and breed these incredible Philippine blue angelfish in a 29-gallon tank, and I wouldn't feel comfortable housing them in anything smaller. In fact, I would prefer to keep them in a 55-gallon tank. Remember, angelfish can grow quite large, so they'll need lots of room to fully develop and display their elaborate fins. Also, keep in mind that these beautiful fish can grow as tall as they are long, so a tall aquarium is preferred. Larger volumes of water also help provide a more stable environment for the fish and will require you to change the water less frequently. Nonetheless, angelfish of all ages respond really well to large frequent water changes, and this is especially true of young fish who are still growing rapidly. In fact, many commercial breeders of angelfish change 50% or more of the water every single day. This results in the rapid growth of all age groups and more frequent spawning in the adults. However, for the average hobbyist, changing the water too frequently is probably more disruptive than it is helpful. In this 29-gallon tank housing a single pair of angelfish, I do a 5-gallon water change once a week. Angelfish are usually purchased as juveniles when their bodies are about the size of a U.S. dime or a U.S. quarter. Many fish keepers then put these adorable little juveniles in a community tank with several other species of fish. And everything is fine for a while because angelfish are fairly passive for a cichlid and they get along fine with each other when they're still young. However, those cute little angels grow quickly and soon become too large for the average community tank, and as they approach sexual maturity, they become increasingly aggressive as they begin to form pairs. These pairs will then try to claim a portion of the aquarium as their own, and they'll attack any other fish that enters their territory. This aggressive behavior can wreak havoc in a community tank. And, depending on how many angels you purchased initially, you may have to find new homes for some of them. With this in mind, it's important to decide what your end goal is right from the very beginning and plan accordingly. Are you keeping angelfish just for their beauty, or are you intentionally trying to breed them? Did you buy a small group in order to let them form pairs for future breeding, or did you want to create a community setting with other species of fish? These are all important questions that you'll want to consider before purchasing your angelfish and setting up their aquarium. Planning ahead and knowing the end goal will save you a lot of time, money, and heartache. As a general rule, I prefer to use a sand substrate rather than gravel in most of my tanks. Gravel tends to trap uneaten food where it sits beyond the reach of the fish, whereas with sand, the food still remains accessible on the surface. The choice of substrate is an important decision because the elaborate fins of juvenile angelfish require special consideration when it comes to tank maintenance and general cleanliness. If you're breeding this species with the intention of producing the highest quality fish possible, then the best option is to raise them without a substrate. Because substrates of any type are a haven for harmful bacteria that can adversely affect the growth and proper development of their elaborate fins. Angelfish are adapted to living in slow-moving water so they don't do well in a strong current. This is important to keep in mind when deciding on which filter to use. I recommend using a large sponge filter due to their low flow and highly effective bacterial filtration. Sponge filters are also perfectly safe to use with small fry in the tank. And, as an added bonus, they're inexpensive, easy to use, and easy to clean. Angelfish are not picky eaters and should be very easy to feed. High quality flakes and cichlid pellets can form the bulk of their diet. They have very large appetites and like most fish they always seem hungry. However, it's best not to feed them too much food at any one time. 
Overfeeding can cause trouble with bloating, which can then put pressure on the swim bladder, causing it to malfunction. Persistent overfeeding can also cause a rapid decline in your water quality. And if you intend on breeding them, you may want to try adding frozen foods such as bloodworms and brine shrimp, as well as live foods such as black worms, white worms, or even mosquito larvae. It's important to observe the fish as they eat and take note of any food that remains uneaten so that you can adjust the amount of food that you're providing. Also, keep an eye out for any individuals that might not be getting enough food or sick fish that may not be eating. And remember, it's always better to underfeed than to overfeed. If you plan on breeding your angelfish, then it's best to house a single pair in a tank by themselves. Several juvenile angelfish can be kept together in a group for a while, but once they start to reach sexual maturity and begin pairing off, they'll become increasingly aggressive with each other as well as other species in the same tank. If you're not interested in breeding your angelfish, then I highly recommend keeping a single angelfish as the centerpiece of a community tank. Having just one angelfish in the aquarium will eliminate most, if not all, of its aggression. Be sure to house your angelfish with tank mates that are large enough to not become a meal. Small fish such as neon tetras, celestial pearl danios, guppies, and autosynchless catfish might all become easy meals for a full-grown angelfish. Also, avoid combining your angelfish with small fin-nipping species such as tiger barbs, dwarf gouramis, serpe tetras, and black widow tetras. And if you're combining your angelfish with a school of fast aggressive eaters like zebra danios or rainbow fish, then pay close attention at feeding time to be sure that the angelfish are getting enough food. There are several species that are compatible with angelfish. These species include Corydoras catfish, Cooley loaches, Harlequin rasboras, German blue rams, Bolivian rams, zebra danios, bristlenose plecos, and rainbow fish, just to name a few. Compatibility can be a tricky balancing act, so please keep in mind that every fish will have its own temperament and will respond differently in different environments. There are some angels that are very aggressive all the time, while most are fairly easygoing until they start to breed. So always be ready to make changes if you need to. One important note about the autosynchless catfish. Some are small enough to be eaten by an adult angelfish, yet some people still recommend them as suitable tank mates. My advice is to be careful when housing any small catfish with predatory fish such as the angelfish, because catfish have a defensive mechanism where they can extend and lock their pectoral fins when a larger fish tries to swallow them. Catfish, such as the autosynclus and small Corydoras, have been known to become lodged in the throat of other fish who try to eat them. This scenario rarely ends well for either fish. Outside of when they're just about to spawn, it can be very difficult to tell male and female angelfish apart. However, in this case it's easy and the key is to look at the facial profile of each fish. That's the male on the right and I can tell it's a male because of that big bump on his head. That bump is known as a nuchal hump and only the male angelfish will develop this feature to such an impressive degree. The differences between the facial profiles of the male and female angelfish are not always this pronounced, especially when looking at young fish. However, this can be a helpful clue when combined with other telltale signs. Not all male angelfish develop a nuchal hump, and it may take several years before it becomes this distinctive. 
Another sign of the sex is that male angelfish tend to grow larger and become more aggressive than the females. While this is not 100% reliable, it can be a very helpful key to determining which ones are the males. Another, more reliable indicator of the sex are the breeding tubes that will appear on both the male and the female a week or two before they lay their eggs. The breeding tubes start out small and gradually increase in size as the fish gets closer to spawning. The fish seen here is a female and her breeding tube has begun to show. However, she's still a few days away from laying her eggs, so her breeding tube is still quite small. Here is the same female in the midst of laying her eggs. Her breeding tube is now fully enlarged. The female's breeding tube is thicker than the male's and it has a rounded shape, while the male's breeding tube is thinner and it comes to a finer point. The fish seen here is a male just prior to spawning. His breeding tube is much thinner than the female's. Here again is the breeding tube of a male angelfish. Now let's look at the breeding tubes of both the male and the female side by side so that it's easier to see the differences between the two. Once you can see the breeding tubes on both fish, it's also helpful to make note of the size of their abdomens. If it's a female, she will be filled with eggs, so be sure to look for an enlarged abdomen. The female seen here on the right will lay her eggs on this piece of slate in exactly 12 days from now. If you plan on breeding your angelfish, then obviously you'll need both a male and a female. However, since angelfish are so difficult to sex, picking out a pair of fish from a tank of unsexed juveniles is virtually impossible. So, if you want to breed these fish, there are basically two options. One, you could buy an adult breeding pair. However, proven adult pairs of angelfish can be very expensive. So, most people choose option number two and buy several young fish. Then they let those fish mature until they start forming pairs. Angelfish who have formed a pair bond will tend to stay close to each other. They'll choose a specific section of the tank to call their own and then remain close to this area to chase off any intruders. The difficulty with using this method is that you'll need to provide a large enough aquarium for all of the fish to feel comfortable and have enough room to establish territories and form pair bonds. So, be sure that the tank is not overstocked. If they refuse to form pairs, either provide them with a larger space or reduce the number of juveniles in the aquarium. And remember, aggression is almost always an issue when keeping more than one angelfish in the same aquarium, especially as young fish reach sexual maturity and prepare to spawn. Finally, angelfish do not pair bond for life, and most fish will switch partners if the situation requires. Angelfish are fairly undemanding and it takes very little coaxing to get a mature pair to spawn. As I mentioned earlier, breeding is best done in an aquarium devoted to a single pair of fish, because once a mature pair of angels begin courting each other and defending a territory, they will become very aggressive towards their tank mates. Aggressive to the point of killing other fish in the tank, and the smaller the aquarium, the worse this aggressive scenario becomes. In a community tank setting, smaller, faster tank mates may be able to pick off the tiny eggs or the fry one by one. Furthermore, nocturnal tank mates such as catfish can raid the eggs at night as well as cause repeated disturbances to the sleeping angels. So, for the benefit of everyone involved, I prefer to house my breeding pairs by themselves. 
Angelfish can lay several hundred eggs at a time. The number of eggs that a female can lay is determined in part by the age and size of the fish, the quality and quantity of their food, as well as how clean you can keep the water. The more frequently they spawn, the fewer eggs the female will lay each time. Angelfish that are kept in cooler water will lay eggs less frequently, but when they do eventually spawn, they'll lay more eggs due to the longer rest period in between spawns. If you notice your angelfish repeatedly cleaning a small section of the tank, it's a sure sign that they're about ready to lay eggs. If you see them cleaning an area where you don't want them to lay their eggs, you may want to make some changes to convince them to spawn in a different location. Your angelfish will need a smooth, vertically oriented surface on which to deposit the eggs. If you don't provide them with an appropriate spawning site, the female may deposit her eggs on filter tubes, heaters, large rocks, pieces of driftwood, or even on the glass walls of the aquarium. If your fish keep laying their eggs on a heater, placing the heater horizontally near the substrate will keep the angels from laying their eggs on it. Live plants with large flat leaves such as the Amazon sword plant and Anubius plants work well as spawning sites and provide a more natural spawning location. However, I prefer to have my angels lay their eggs on a more convenient and easily moved surface. So, I offer my angelfish a piece of slate on which to deposit their eggs. When choosing the spawning surfaces that you'll provide, be sure to keep in mind that it may be necessary at some point in the future to remove the eggs from the aquarium and place them in a separate container for incubation. So, be sure that the spawning surfaces that you have chosen will fit standing up vertically in the breeding tank as well as the incubation vessel. Alternative spawning sites can include specially made breeding cones, large ceramic tiles, and some people even use pieces of PVC pipe. Once the angelfish have finished spawning, you are left with two options. One, you can leave the eggs with the adults and allow them to care for their own young. This is the simplest and most rewarding of the two options, but it's also the one most likely to fail, because many angelfish will either eat the eggs after spawning, or they'll care for the eggs until they hatch, and then eat the newly hatched wrigglers or the fry. This is fairly common, especially with young pairs who are still new at parenting. However, some angelfish with a bit of practice will eventually learn how to raise their own young. The second option is to remove the eggs in the slate from the breeding tank and care for them yourself in a separate container, and there are multiple ways that this can be done. The method that I have chosen for this video allows me to film the eggs and their development up close. In this scenario, I carefully remove the slate with the eggs on it and place it in a 5.5 gallon tank that I have prepared ahead of time. When removing the eggs, it's okay to expose them to the air briefly. The eggs do not have to remain submerged the whole time. Just don't dawdle because you wouldn't want them to start drying out. The slate is placed in the incubation tank and kept standing upright just as it was in the breeding tank. This incubation tank should be set up well ahead of time. Mine contains an air stone that is held in place using a suction cup designed to hold airline tubing. It's very important that the air stone does not become dislodged and move around as this could potentially damage the eggs. The air stone does not have to be directly beneath the eggs, but the water around them should be kept moving rapidly. I adjust mine so that the rising bubbles don't touch the eggs. The incubation tank also contains a heater that has been set up ahead of time so that the temperature of the water is within one or two degrees of the water in the breeding tank. And this brings me to an important point. The warmer the water, the faster the eggs will develop and hatch, which means they'll have less time to develop a fungus. So I keep my breeding tanks and my incubation tanks somewhere between 82 and 84 degrees. 
You can use distilled water, RO water, or dechlorinated tap water to fill the incubation tank. I don't recommend using the dirty water from the breeding tank because it's filled with fungal spores, bacteria, and dissolved waste. Both RO water and distilled water can be obtained in a grocery store for a modest price. Be sure to read the labels carefully before using any bottled water. However, in most cases, dechlorinated tap water will work just fine. In order to keep the eggs from developing a deadly fungus, an antifungal agent is usually added to the water in the incubation vessel. The most commonly used antifungal is methylin blue. It's very effective, but it can be very messy, and it will stain everything that it touches bright blue. A much safer, less messy, and non-staining alternative to methylene blue is to use 3% hydrogen peroxide at a dosage of 2 teaspoons for every 2.5 gallons of water. Hydrogen peroxide dissipates very quickly, usually within 12 hours, so don't put it in the incubation tank until you're ready to put in the eggs. After the initial dose of hydrogen peroxide, I add a second dose 24 hours later. I don't use a filter in the incubation tank, but it's important to note that both hydrogen peroxide and methylene blue will kill the beneficial bacteria in your filter. One of the great things about fish eggs is that most of them are transparent, and this transparency provides us with a window through which we can see the miraculous creation of a tiny life. The eggs seen here were fertilized by the male angelfish just three or four hours ago. That large white spot on each of these eggs is a special cluster of cells that are rapidly dividing and multiplying through a process known as mitosis. As the egg continues to develop, this white cluster of cells will begin to lighten in color as the cells start to spread out across the surface of the yolk. A few hours later, and the white spot on each of these eggs has lightened considerably as the cells move from one end of the egg to the other. Some of these cells will remain at this end of the egg in a small space that's left behind, and this is where the head of the angelfish will begin to take form. The eggs are now just 24 hours old and the beginnings of a tiny embryo can be seen on the surface of the yolk. This milky colored line running from one end of the egg to the other is a special group of cells known as the embryonic ridge. These cells are now busy at work creating the different organs of the body that will one day become part of an adult angelfish. At this end, you can see the head, and at this end, the tail is beginning to take form. At a temperature of 82 to 84 degrees, my angelfish eggs usually hatch within about 48 hours. At a temperature of 80 degrees, it takes more like 60 hours. These eggs are ready to hatch at any second. However, the birth of an angelfish is not very exciting. The baby angelfish uses its tail to break free of the egg membrane. And once the tail emerges, the rest of the angelfish can remain inside the egg for several hours. The air stone beneath the eggs is left running, even after the eggs have hatched. If these eggs were being cared for by the adults, both parents would have gathered up the newly hatched babies and moved them from the slate to a new location in the aquarium. The white eggs seen here have failed to develop most likely because they weren't fertilized. However, they never attracted a fungus and didn't appear to pose any danger to the other eggs. Once the eggs have hatched, the baby angelfish are commonly known as wrigglers. Technically speaking, wrigglers are the larval form of the adult fish. Angelfish larvae will wriggle like this for about four to five days.
This is a very delicate stage of their development, and the rate at which they move through this stage is determined in part by two very important factors. One, the temperature of the water, and two, the amount of dissolved oxygen that the water contains. In the wild, adult angelfish have been known to move their wrigglers from an area where there are low levels of dissolved oxygen and then hang those wrigglers on leaves near the surface where there are higher levels of oxygen in the water. This behavior is known as fry hanging, and it's only made possible because the wrigglers have special glands located on the top of the head known as adhesive glands. These glands produce a sticky mucus that enables the wrigglers to attach to various surfaces in the aquarium as well as each other. The secretions from the adhesive glands can even form long threads from which dozens of wrigglers can hang suspended. These sticky threads help keep the increasingly active wrigglers in a compact group, and this makes it much easier for the parents to keep them all safe from harm. The cells that produce the sticky mucus are known as goblet cells. These goblet cells are more active at nightfall when the fading light makes it increasingly difficult for the parents to keep track of their offspring. So the production of mucus by the goblet cells increases as the sun drops below the horizon. Adhesive glands are not unique to angelfish. In fact, they're quite common in many species of cichlids. They can also be found in freshwater elephant fish, the African clawed frog, blind cave fish, many polypterous species, sturgeon, and even some species of the lungfish, just to name a few. Now, let's take a closer look at those adhesive glands. The wriggler seen here is three days old and the adhesive glands are clearly visible. There are four of them on the crown of the head and two more in between the eyes. Be sure to notice the tiny pectoral fins. The adhesive glands are temporary structures that begin to disappear when the wrigglers are about five days old. The five-day mark is also about when the wrigglers will have used up the last of the food reserves contained in their yolk sacs. These two events mark the end of the larval stage, and at this point the baby angelfish will begin to swim. The fry are now four days old, and they're starting to swim for the very first time. They'll need to make the long journey to the surface of the water where they'll repeatedly swallow small bits of air which will then be used to inflate their swim bladders. Without a properly inflated swim bladder, these fry are not able to float effortlessly like their parents, so for tiny little fry like these, swimming requires a substantial amount of energy. This is something to keep in mind when raising these fish, because a heavy current and a very tall tank makes the all-important act of reaching the surface of the water that much more difficult. In fact, at this early stage of their development, it may be beneficial to decrease the water flow in the aquarium so that it's less difficult for the young fry to reach the surface for air. Reducing the water level in the aquarium can also be helpful. Now let's take a closer look to see what's happening at the surface of the aquarium. These four-day-old fry are swallowing air from the surface of the water. Notice how this one coils its body like a snake just before it springs forward to swallow a gulp of air. I know it doesn't look like much, but this simple instinctive act of swimming to the surface and swallowing air is critical for its survival. And this brings me to an important point. If your angelfish are dying right about when they're starting to swim for the first time, you may want to look into anything that may be hindering the fry's ability to reach the surface of the water for air.
octopi typically wait until the fry have been free swimming for about 12 hours before their first feeding. The fry are very sensitive to poor water quality, so feed lightly at first and don't allow uneaten food to sit in the aquarium decomposing. Clean, warm water is vitally important at this early stage of their development, and this is where most people probably run into trouble. During the first few weeks of life, I change 50% of the water twice per day. This is done once in the morning and once in the evening, approximately 12 hours apart. I use airline tubing as a siphon hose to carefully remove the water as well as any debris that is collected on the bottom of the tank. During each water change, I also look for and remove any dead fry or fry that seem defective. Then I slowly replace the old water with clean dechlorinated water of the same temperature. And because it's so important, I'll stress it again, clean water is critical for the proper development of your angelfish fry. Their elaborate fins are easily damaged by high levels of dissolved waste and harmful bacteria. This is especially true in the first few weeks of life when the fins are still developing. A bare-bottom tank containing a sponge filter, a heater, and a handful of java moss is all you really need. The best filter to use is a sponge filter that attaches to the side of the tank because sponge filters that sit on the bottom of the aquarium can move around and crush young fry. This type of filter also makes it easier to clean the bottom of the tank without the filter getting in the way. Crowding the fry can slow down their growth and interfere with proper fin development. Also, putting the fry in too large of a tank can make it difficult for them to find their food. So, you'll need to strike a balance between giving them enough room to grow while still keeping them in a tight group so that they don't have to use a lot of energy searching for food. In the very early stages of growth, I like to keep my spawns in a two and a half gallon tank. The confined space makes it easy for the fry to find their food and it makes it easier for me to keep a close eye on their development. For really large spawns, I use a larger tank, but I wouldn't use anything bigger than a 5 or 10 gallon aquarium in the first two weeks of life. I feed my fry small portions three to four times per day. I use newly hatched baby brine shrimp, micro worms, and a prepared food called forced bites. The smaller the prey item, the better, especially in the first week after their free swimming. Baby brine shrimp grow quickly and may become too large for the fry in as little as 12 hours, so it's best to use newly hatched brine shrimp as quickly as possible. When the fry are about 3 to 4 weeks old, I transition them to a high quality flake food and small cichlid pellets. Be very careful with prepared foods and only use small amounts in the beginning as it may take the fry some time to realize that it's food. Be very careful not to overfeed as this can cause a rapid decline in water quality. I use the size of their bellies as an indicator of when I should feed or when they've had enough food. If you're feeding baby brine shrimp, look for an orange belly as an indication that they're well fed. Remember, small frequent feedings and warm clean water will result in rapid growth. These fry are two weeks old and growing quickly on a steady diet of brine shrimp and microworms. At three to four weeks of age, the fry start to take on the characteristic shape of an adult angelfish. Here they are at five weeks old, eating microworms. Microworms are easy to culture and can survive in the aquarium for a day or two before they die and begin decomposing. However, angelfish have very big appetites, so live food rarely survives for very long. The fry are now about two months old. They have bodies about the size of a U.S. nickel or a U.S. dime. This is what I consider to be a marketable size. At three months old, they have bodies that are about the size of a U.S. quarter. They get along fine with each other and even move around the aquarium together in a small group. And finally, here they are at five months of age. Their aggression levels are increasing, and in another month or so, they'll begin to form pairs. 
And that brings us to the end of this incredible journey. We've seen the adults prepare a spawning site and lay their eggs. Then we were able to watch the eggs develop and hatch. We were then able to see those tiny wrigglers grow and change into free-swimming fry. Finally, we were able to see the fry develop and grow into mature adults. Hopefully, you were able to see things that you've never seen before and learn some things that you didn't know. Please help support my effort to continue bringing you these high-quality documentaries by subscribing to this channel, hitting the like button, and leaving a comment. And, as always, I thank you for your time.